han en hår i vårt våje och vinser på. Amen. Christos har jag med revots. Christ is risen from the dead. Says ye mes mes avedis to you and to us great news. Last week, I focused my sermon on a very simple question. And the question was, so what? Yes, Christ rose from the dead, but why should I, who am still alive, why should I care? And of course, the answer that I proposed in this sermon was the fact that the resurrected life begins today, not on the day of our death. Right? Eternal life is not something far away, but something that begins from the day of our birth, from the baptismal font. And so if the natural question emerging from hearing the Easter gospel proclaimed last Sunday was, so what? Another question is likely to surface once we accept that the gospel does matter to us today. And that question is also quite simple, but it's one that has profound significance for our lives. Last Sunday's question was, so what? This Sunday's question is, now what? Last week, we heard the Easter gospel that death has been defeated and that new life in Christ has been granted. And yet, the story of the Bible did not end with the Gospels. In the very fact that we have many books which come after the end of the Gospels, we have a natural question which is raised. After the resurrection, then what? Of course, what we see is the fact that the good news of the Gospel compels a response from those who hear it. And the seven weeks of, in of Easter tide that we are currently in the season of are all focused on the historical response to the gospel. That response that we hear from the earliest of Christians. One way that we focus on this is through the reading of a book of the Bible that we don't typically get in our lectionary. It's really just reserved for this time period. And that book is the book of the Acts of the Apostles. This is the book which records the now what of those earliest of Christians, how they responded when they heard the Gospels. And so, starting with Easter, we begin to read through the Acts of the Apostles, and for several weeks we will be reading from this book. And all of this ends up culminating with a feast day on the 50th day of Easter, which is called Pentecost. And this was the ultimate answer to the question of now what, which was offered to us by the earliest of Christians. The Feast of Pentecost was the moment when the earliest Christians, the church, ended up accepting a transformation which was offered by God through the descent of the Holy Spirit, the formation of what would come to be known as the body of Christ his very real and living presence here on this earth, which is made up of you and of me. This was the response that the earliest Christians took. They heard the gospel, but that was not the end. How were they going to begin living in that gospel every day of their lives? And so, of course, it's nice to look back and to read the Acts of the Apostles and see what they did. However, it was not just those earliest of Christians who were called to respond to the Gospel, but each and every one of us in this sanctuary who are compelled to answer the very same question. Now what? Will we welcome this new resurrected life into our hearts? Or, instead, will we choose to remain in the brokenness of a world far apart from Christ? In the life of the church, today's Sunday is what is referred to as New Sunday, Nor Giragi. You might ask why this Sunday is called Nor Giragi, New Sunday. 
And one of the reasons, there are many reasons, but one of the reasons is because the gospel reading which falls on this Sunday is the opening to the Apostle John's gospel, which begins with a sort of new creation account. I think we're probably more familiar with the creation account that we find in the opening pages of the Bible in Genesis, where we hear that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, John's Gospel opens in a similar way, and that was the reading we just heard today, where we hear about another beginning. We hear, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And of course, what John is doing in the way that he opens his Gospel is to boldly proclaim that that very Word by which God spoke and all things came into existence in the opening pages of Genesis, that very same word was actually a person. And that was the very same person who came and dwelt among us and ushered in a new creation. A new creation which was offered to us through his resurrection from the dead on Easter Sunday. The word created the world, and the word on Easter Sunday recreated the world, making it a new creation, different from the old and broken creation that all of us are all too familiar with. A new creation, a new Sunday, a beautiful feast for us to celebrate just eight days after Easter Sunday. And I think that while many of us have undergone some sort of of a recreation during our journeys of Lent, which culminated in Holy Week and Easter Sunday, I think, sure, many of us have gone through some sort of a transformation. But I think that also, there are many of us, if we're honest, who have returned to the old creation, to business as usual. Easter Sunday may have offered a nice opportunity to reflect on God's promises and the hope of the resurrection, but on Easter Monday, our lives went on. We needed to get back to the drudgery of everyday life, and it was almost as if nothing had ever happened. For many of us, our implicit answer to the question of now what is quite simple. Nothing. So the question becomes, why is that the response that so many of us, myself included, fall into on a regular basis. A response which is a lack of a response to the gospel. And I think that the key to why so many of us fall out of the hope and the light and the transformative love of the Easter gospel can be explained through an image that's given to us by Christ, but much earlier in the gospels. This context has nothing to do with his death and his resurrection, but actually has to do with a dispute among the teachers of the day about the fasting and prayer practices of Christ's disciples. John the Baptist and his disciples and the Pharisees and the scribes and their disciples all kept a very strict fasting regiments and very strict prayer protocols, and yet they saw that Christ's disciples didn't do any of these things. They seemed to be sloppy with their spirituality. And in response to this criticism that we hear from the scribes and the Pharisees of Christ and his ministry, he offers us two analogies. The first is that he describes an old garment that had been broken, and people tried to repair it by taking a new piece of fabric and sewing it on. And I know we have at least one seamstress among us, I don't know other people who have worked with clothing, but apparently, this does not work out very well. That the difference in the way that the materials have aged ends up forcing the old garment to rip because of the addition of the new piece of fabric. He gives us a second analogy, too, where he says that the fasting and the prayer practices that the Pharisees and the scribes are trying to promote are kind of like trying to put new wine into old wineskins. And what's the process of this? If you have aged and brittle wineskins, and you have this brand new wine, and you try to put it in, the result is that the wineskins 
first. And so Christ is implying that the ways that you have all taught your disciples to pray, O scribes and Pharisees, and to fast, these no longer fit with the life that I have come to offer. Your old way of praying and of fasting was trying to prove your devotion to God, right? Trying to get into his good graces, trying to earn favor with him. And yet, my followers, who one day will come to fast and to pray just as yours do, they do so for a very different reason. Not to earn favor with me, not to end up in the good graces of God in heaven, but to, grow, but to draw those followers closer to God, to remove distractions from their lives and to allow them to sit in conversation with their heavenly Father. Christ says that the old wineskins of fasting and of praying, the way that you're doing it, will not be able to contain the enormity and the grandeur of the new wine that I have come to offer. So, of course, Christ uses this analogy of the old wineskins containing the new wine in this very particular context. But I think that this analogy profoundly reflects a much broader struggle that each and every one of us encounter when trying to allow the Easter gospel to transform our lives. I think we often fall into the trap of trying to take the new wine of the resurrected life in Christ and trying to contain it within the old wineskins of our broken hearts. We want to hold this new wine without switching out our old wineskins for new ones. We try to take the new wine of Christ's new and resurrected life and to store it in the old wineskins of toxic and unhealthy habits, of superfluous indulgences and degrading behaviors, of immediate and unfettered responses to our basis, most animalistic appetites, of letting our feelings drive every decision that we make. We try to take the new wine of Christ's victory over death and to store it in the old wineskins of pettiness, of keeping score, of dwelling on things that just simply aren't important while ignoring the matters of most critical importance in our lives, of holding on to the speck in the other person's eye while ignoring the log in our own eye. We try to take the new wine of God's infinite love for us and to store it in our old wineskins of hatred and resentment toward our enemies, toward complete strangers, toward our neighbors, and even toward those closest to us, our family members and our spouses and our children. And when we insist on storing the new wine of the resurrected life in the same old wineskins of our broken hearts, why are we surprised when these old wineskins leak? When we live in this new life for just a little bit, right? And we realize that the old wineskins of our lives slowly leak as we go back to our old ways. Why does this surprise us? Why, why are we surprised when these old wineskins burst? When a tragedy strikes and all the memories of Christ's promises and new life burst out of our minds and of our hearts? Why are we so surprised that these old wineskins end up turning the new wine of the gospel rancid? That when we still hold the gospel in our minds, but we have lost the sweet flavor that it has come to offer, why are we surprised that our old wineskins turn the gospel sour and bitter and even putrid to us? In its original context, Christ wraps up this image to the scribes and the Pharisees by saying that no one after drinking old wine desires the new, for he says the old is good. What Christ is noting here is that often we get so used to the rancid 
tainted wine of this world of resentment and of quarreling, of hopelessness and sorrow, of hatred and division, of self-absorption, and the isolation that it brings, that we simply become accustomed to its bitter taste. And we lose the appetite for the sweet wine of the resurrected life that the Lord has come to offer. And so on this new Sunday, my prayer is that each and every one of us may yearn for the new wine of Christ's everlasting life. That we take time to discern the ways in which we might be trying to put the gospel into the old wineskins of our brokenness. That we're not willing to let the brokenness go in order to get new wineskins of hearts that are renewed to receive the new wine of Christ. That we may allow the transformation of our hearts that is required to take place in order to hold the sweetest of wines within them. And by allowing ourselves to be filled with the new wine of a life in Christ, may we, one by one, usher in God's kingdom by allowing it first to abide within our own hearts and then by sharing it with others each and every day of our lives. Taste and see that the new and resurrected life in Christ is indeed sweet, for which we offer our risen Lord praise and glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen.